All right, so we are into the last talk of the day. It's on innovative foundation for an open source API management platform uh, by Asanka Abai Singhe. Over to you, Asanka. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Asanka. Uh, I work for WSO2 uh, as the director of solutions architecture. So WSO2 is a technology company that we provide um, uh, enterprise open source uh, middleware stack for on-premise as well as um, uh, cloud. And I'm a committer of Apache um, uh, Synapse project and contributing heavily to uh, Apache Synapse. So the, uh, when I look at the agenda, this is the only uh, API related topic. Uh, so I thought of kind of give you uh, a kind of an introduction to what is uh, business APIs and then uh, go through the uh, low level technical stuff. So uh, when I talk to people, uh, when we meet in these uh, events like that, uh, what is API? People give different type of definitions of the business APIs because they see it in different ways. So for my definition of the API is something like this. Uh, it's kind of uh, popular as well as successful. So I pick uh, three key players from NBA uh, because I like basketball. Uh, so that's how I see about business API. But if you look at it in detail, so uh, as technical, uh, uh, people, we deal with a uh, bunch of APIs, like we deal with low-level uh, technical APIs, but business APIs are a little bit different because what it does basically, it exposes the, um, uh, the internal business functionality as an API through uh, a network and then uh, through the internet using different type of uh, standards. So, um, and then uh, it provides a well-defined well -defined interface because a person who will be invoking the API, they should know what they invoke. So it provides a well-defined uh, interface as well. And then addition to that, uh, uh, not like low-level technical API, it provides a service level agreement and then again, uh, organization expose their uh, functionality as API. So it has to be secured and then again, it has to be managed and uh, it should go through the authentication, authorization, and then again, it should control who's accessing the API as well as it should monetize as well as uh, um, the uh, monitor as well. So those are kind of uh, fundamentals of a business API. So the growth of the API, if we look at uh, from 2000 and 2000, 2012, it has increased uh, uh, very uh, rapidly. So that's why we can't ignore about business APIs because an organization that doesn't have an API, uh, they can't really um, uh, uh, survive because today's business are kind of uh, interrelated and integrated. So the main way of integrating business has become the business APIs. So the volume now, uh, the, the data volumes, if you look at how people uh, uh, use the APIs, if you look at uh, Twitter, it's kind of more than 15 billion. And then again, if you look at Netflix, uh, if more than 1 billion. And uh, Facebook, Amazon, and eBay, if you look at it's kind of a really high volume. That's where that we need to have a, a API management solution as well as it has to be properly scalable to uh, handle this type of load. And then again, if you um, uh, expose a public API, you never know uh, the volume because it's public and a lot of people can come and execute your APIs. So the technical challenge we have with the APIs, like um, not like earlier days, like when we wrote applications, only we had a, a web UI or a desktop UI, but today the, the consumers are different, like consumers come with many forms, like uh, mobile apps and then connected cars, tablets, like that. So that's where we need kind of a unified API that anybody can come and write an app and consume through this type of channel. So that is the technical challenge. And as developers, uh, this created a new uh, kind of a relationship that um, we did talk about B2B, we did talk about B2G, but now this is kind of B2D, a business to developer uh, relationship that created with the APIs because uh, the organizations provide APIs for the developers to write applications by uh, leveraging the uh, APIs provided. So that's a new concept. And if you look at the API usage, like we can categorize them. There can be external APIs, anybody can access, we call them as public APIs, and there can be a private APIs that the organization will give that uh, access for a specific uh, set of people. 
And then again, uh, there will be internal APIs, uh, because if you look at larger organizations, the uh, services might be written by different business units. So APIs can be used to um, kind of uh, have a common service platform by having a public API that can access by all the business units, or a private API that you give specific access, like a, a human, human uh, resource department can handle some kind of functionality, but an accounting department can handle some kind of functionality and there can be some private uh, uh, public APIs that to find the employee details like that so you can categorize the APIs on this stuff and then uh, the demand of the APIs are really high because people are looking at um, to leverage different type of business functionalities and when we look at the demand from the technical side it looks like this because people looking for restful um, JSON savvy, uh, secured by OAuth, and then uh, compatible with web API designs like uh, Hetios. So this is what people are looking at. But uh, the challenge we have, the most of the services that we have inside in our organizations that we wrote for decades, those are not um, uh, compatible with the demand that we have. So uh, the, if you look at the services, they, they are like this, like it might use SOAP, it might use um, REST, and uh, different type of bindings that they have to invoke the APIs, and different type of development languages used to uh, write the API, write the services, and the functionality is mainly focused on some uh, uh, specific thing, um, and uh, it might be written uh, based on silos, depend on the uh, business unit. So this is what we have in uh, backends. So that's where the, uh, the pattern called the API facade will be really helpful that um, you can hide that complexity that you uh, have in your backend services and uh, put a mediation layer and use the facade to uh, expose the API as a restful and secured with OAuth and uh, incorporate all the, uh, the API management related functionalities that we uh, discussed earlier and provide the uh, external format or the demand, cater the demand that coming from the outside. So that is the API management uh, pattern that we discuss. And the, um, if you look at uh, API as an ecosystem, then we find different type of ca characters or the actors, a person who create the APIs, we call them uh, API creators. And then there's a gatekeeper, like who decide which APIs that you should publish, which APIs that you should deprecate, what sort of vers versions that uh, you should expose and monitor the API. We call them as the API publisher. Then the uh, API consumers, that the developers who will uh, subscribe for the APIs and develop mobile apps or web apps, they, we call them as the API consumers. So those are the three uh, main characters that we can find. So with these three characters, uh, the architecture looks like this. We need a gateway that we expose the API and then to handle the traffic coming from the consumers. And then there are two other um, uh, architecture components. One is called the publisher that the uh, to use and maintain the life cycle of an API, like you uh, publish an API, you manage an API, monitor the API, and then you decide what to do with the API, that's the API life cycle. And then the uh, consumers will have a life cycle as well, people will subscribe and then use the API to that. Uh, there should be a marketplace, we call it as a store, uh, that should have in this particular architecture. So the solution that we build on top of the Apache components, we uh, used this, uh, uh, components, a gateway, a store, a publisher, a OAuth server to handle uh, OAuth, and then an uh, analytical platform, uh, that's where we store uh, all these uh, API invocations, a load balancer, uh, so the analytical platform divided into multiple components, um, uh, a receiver, uh, analyzer, and a uh, store. So the, uh, the, that's a relational database coming into the picture as well because the store is a NoSQL database, uh, but uh, most of the people like to deal with relational databases. So the summarized data, to store the summarized data, we uh, introduce a relational database. But uh, most of these components can be replaced if there is an existing uh, uh, OAuth server, analyzer, load balancer, uh, you can replace them as well. So when it comes to the Apache family, how we utilize Apache components, uh, so uh, for the gateway, we use Apache Synapse as the co-mediation uh, logic. 
and uh, the load balancer again um, make the synapse into a, a load balancing uh, configuration and use Apache Synapse there. And the OAuth server, we are using a OAuth implementation called Apache Amber uh, as the OAuth server. And then uh, the, uh, the receiver, to have high performance uh, event uh, collection, we are using uh, Thrift as the protocol in two, two levels. One, to collect the events, as well as there's a communication in between gateway and OAuth server. I will explain it in a different slide. We are using Apache Thrift as well. Then uh, the analyzer, uh, so we store all the raw data into uh, event store uh, on top of Cassandra. And uh, so the, uh, to uh, make this uh, raw data into a structured data, we are using Hadoop. And the queries coming into Hadoop, uh, we use Hive, because Hive is kind of more um, a person who's family with SQL, they can uh, easily write Hive queries. So the analyzer will, um, uh, listen to the event store and then do periodic uh, updates and uh, update the relational database. Addition to that, we are using Zookeeper as well because uh, now when you deploy these components in a distributed manner into many nodes, we need some coordination. So we use a Zookeeper to handle the coordination across uh, these nodes. So those are the products that we utilize heavily from uh, Apache family when we are building this. So how, um, uh, we uh, uh, bring these, uh, sorry, uh, Apache components into our architecture. So we have something called Carbon. It's the uh, programming model to develop middleware that we use. And then again, it provides uh, OSGI-based Java runtime to run uh, applications. So if you are familiar with Apache Caraf and uh, Eclipse Virgo, so this is a similar OSGI runtime that we use to build all the applications. So what we do basically, if the Apache component is OSGI uh, compliant, then we use the bundles and then put it into the Carbon runtime. If it is not, then we OSGI-fy them and then put it to the runtime. That's how we utilize the uh, Apache components and we use OSGI to do the internal uh, communication of the uh, components running inside the runtime. That's how the combination works. And if we do any modification, then we contribute it back to the, uh, the, uh, the original project because we have committers on most of the projects that I described earlier. So uh, the, uh, to show how uh, this uh, API works, API uh, work in a runtime, so I took a sample, example like uh, we assume we have a order service, a RESTful service that uh, written on some standard like uh, uh, JAX-RS or something like that. So the uh, first what will happen, the publisher uh, will create an API by referring the backend service. And then he published the API so it will get proper, it will uh, change the state to published and then propagate to the store and the gateway. Then the consumer will come into the picture. He will start writing applications. So he will subscribe for the uh, API and then the API store will provide the API key and uh, then he can use that particular key and consume the API. So that's basically the flow. And if there's a response coming back, it will come back and uh, come to the application. So that is how the um, API work in the invocation path. Then uh, the, uh, how we use the Synapse runtime, originally Synapse had a concept called proxy service, a message receiver that uh, you can send messages to Synapse runtime, uh, we call it as a proxy service. So what we did, we introduced another message receiver called APIs because um, we thought of changing the proxy service uh, to handle RESTful services, but uh, uh, it uh, was okay to handle basic HTTP GET and some simple stuff, but to have the other HTTP verbs as well as uh, uh, to handle HTOs, we thought of um, introduce a new message receiver called APIs and it will uh, expose the backend, any kind of service in, uh, in a restful manner. So that's how we utilize the Synapse uh, runtime to expose the APIs. So internally, an API uh, will link to a resource or multiple resources, and then it will connect to the backend services. So it can be a single resource or multiple resource that you can expose through a simple API. So uh, if you look at the example, so the schema will look like the where you run, the host and the port, and then uh, there should be authority, and 
the uh, path to the particular resource. So as an example, if I'm running it in my local machine in, on 8280, then uh, the trade is the context that we use in the API, and then there's a version. So the context and the version are the authority of the API, and then you can, ha you can have the resource, and if you need more uh, uh, parameters or templates, you can pass it with the URL. So that is how the URL looks like in the, um, uh, this model. And then this is how it map uh, different type of uh, HTTP methods. So um, uh, based on the uh, header, we identify what's the HTTP method and then dispatch it to the relevant uh, backend service. So that's how the dispatching works. And the configuration is simple, like it looks like this, like all the, uh, the API related information uh, uh, store in as kind of header metadata and then we define each and every resource. And if you need to do any mediation, like assume it's a backend, uh, backend service is uh, a SOAP uh, based service, then you can do those type of uh, protocol switching by a change in the configuration and uh, associating a relevant message builder for that. So that's the advantage because uh, you can um, uh, kind of uh, hide the complexity of your backend services and then uh, define it as a single API. As well as now, if you need to define a new API by calling multiple services, then even you can do simple things like service chaining, orchestration by using uh, this logic um, by adding uh, the necessary functionalities. And the security part, I explained we use uh, auth as default. Uh, so we use the auth handler. So if you are interested on a different uh, authentication mechanism, because some of the users, they are using things like basic code, and then some have their own kind of authentication servers and protocols. So it's uh, just a matter of add an extension and replace that auth handler. And to have uh, and minimize the latency of uh, API call, uh, we introduced two caching uh, points. One is inside the gateway and one is inside the key management server. So the key management server can cache most of the stuff that it picked from the user store and um, minimize the latency as much as possible. But uh, depend on the security architecture, we have to decide which cache has to be used because some of the uh, security patterns doesn't allow to keep a cache inside the uh, gateway layer. So this is how the uh, OAuth model works in uh, this uh, architecture. And uh, in the OAuth 2.0, uh, so there are uh, three keys provided, a consumer key, consumer secret, and access token. So the access token is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the main thing to invoke the API. And a consumer key and consumer secret can use to get a new access token. So uh, that's how it works. And uh, so OAuth uh, got the multiple, multiple profiles. So we currently support uh, uh, the, uh, the core OAuth specification. And we support bearer token profile. And uh, there's a new thing called JWT or JSON web tokens. Because if you need now in this architecture, the authentication and authorization happen at the gateway level. But if you need to do any authentication and authorization at the backend service level, you can pass some of the credentials as a header. So that's where the JWT come into the picture. So uh, you can uh, embed those uh, uh, credentials and send it to the backend. And some of the uh, New concepts uh, with if you have kind of a, a single sign on model with SAML2, then there's a new uh, uh, profile called SAML2.0 bear assertion profile that you can use with OAuth. Uh, so we do support that as well in this solution. So uh, these are some command line stuff like how you can get uh, um, consumer, how you pass the consumer key, consumer secret, and get. Uh, uh, access token, that's the top one. So I use curl in this uh, example, but you can embed it inside your application. And then this is how the header, uh, this is how the message looks like, uh, uh, how it send the access token and the token type, and uh, there's expiration of that, as well as uh, it sends a refresh token if you need to refresh it. And this is how you invoke an API by using the, uh, the access a token. So after there there's an access token and you invoke it with the HTTP method and the URL. So that is how you uh, invoke the API. So the, uh, the data basically now, uh, we have the, uh, the gateway working uh, with uh, expose the APIs and the consumers come and talk to the API. 
So we need to uh, collect all the information inside the, uh, uh, from the, uh, the gateway. So uh, we introduce a, a data agent that collect all the data and publish to the, uh, the monitoring system. So that's where the thrift come into the picture. And what will happen, it will take the uh, data and write to the Cassandra database. And based on the, uh, the uh, MapReduce jobs that we run inside Hadoop uh, by using Hive, uh, scheduled by Hive, so it will run all these MapReduce jobs and then write to a relational database. And you can use reporting engines as well as uh, 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 dashboards to get those data. So that's how the, the analytics works on this solution. So the, uh, now we have the data and then uh, how it, uh, so what we can do, we can gather the API data, we can do the slicing and dicing, and then we can decide what we should do, and then we can adjust the parameters of the solution. So the gathering data, uh, like by default, uh, it has an event uh, that uh, collect the statistics, but if you need more uh, information, you can change the uh, event because uh, it's a raw data. Uh, key value pairs that you can send based on your message type. Then the slicing and dicing will happen based on the KPIs that you need to write. So you can write um, uh, different type of KPIs. Uh, this is example uh, higher query that you can write and collect, uh, process this data by using the MapReduce jobs. Then once you have that data, you can decide what you can do. You can identify the trends and then you can, uh, you can compare with the past results and then uh, we can uh, uh, push them to a reporting and dashboard engine as well. Then the, uh, the, once you have those data, what you can, uh, how you can adjust the parameters. So if you need to scale, because now you know what's your throughput and then what's your um, latency. So if you need to increase your server cap capacity, you can decide it based on the information that you have. And then uh, like um, you can retire some of the APIs if the APIs are not utilized much. And uh, if you need to introduce new APIs, then you can introduce them as well based on the information that you have. So the scalability, uh, uh, there are a number of deployments that you can do. So I pick some of a uh, couple of um, uh, samples that you can, how you can deploy them. So you can scale the gateway layer because that's the commonly heavily uh, hitting. And then you can uh, scale the auth layer as well because uh, it has to be proportionately um, scaled because uh, most of the, uh, 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 the hits that hit the gateway will go to the auth server. And rest of the component, based on how you do the capacity planning, you can deploy them in a cluster. So this is a basic uh, deployment, and you can extend up to n number of nodes by introducing more nodes. Uh, and even the uh, data analyzer part, you can have n number of uh, Cassandra rings and uh, have uh, more uh, processing units as well. So this is basically the, uh, the red line is uh, basically the LAN and the uh, DMZ. If you are providing an external API management solution, but if you are using it internally, then you can install everything inside and run as an internal solution as well. So uh, the product is uh, this, so you can go to that URL and download. This is Apache 2.2 license, and you can even get the source code from the source repository and use it. Uh, that's how you can take the product. And uh, in summary, uh, so this is what we provide like by utilizing the, uh, the Apache components. Uh, so we provide the framework that people can find and subscribe for the APIs. And then uh, you can manage, secure, and protect your APIs, as well as you can uh, monitor and monetize your APIs as well without putting much effort because uh, um, uh, the product provide all the features. So I will kind of uh, walk you through quickly uh, a demo uh, and then show how uh, it works. So I have all these components running and um, uh, so this is the UI. Uh, so I will log into the UI. This is a gateway component and um, uh, it got the uh, publisher and a store. Those are the sub components that we have. So I will go to the uh, publisher. So this is the um, publisher. And you need to log in. Basically, a tech op person or a dev op person will use this UI and log in to the uh, publisher. So these are the APIs that I have created already. So um, I will take a sample uh, uh, backend service, a REST service. 
Uh, so this is the REST service that I have. And if I run it, uh, okay. So it doesn't give a, a output. It provides a set of uh, references uh, of the value. And then you have to use the ref to get the actual value. Sorry. Yeah, that's the issue. Okay, so it provides a JSON output like this. So what I'll do, I'll expose this API using the, uh, the solution and show you how to do that. So uh, this is the basic publisher uh, UI. And what I'll do, add a new API. So I will use something. So this is the uh, name of the API. Um, some name. And then the context, basically. So uh, I will use uh, as the context. And we can provide a version. So any version will be fine. And description, uh, I will not keep it blank. And then whether it's a public or a restricted API. And then you can even have a thumbnail image. So I will take something like this. And the uh, URL to the back end. So I will take that URL. Okay. And uh, if you have a test now, if you uh, when once you expose the API, there should be a way for the developers to test it. So you can provide a sandbox URL to your test system as well, uh, addition to the production URL. Then, uh, if it is a SOAP-based service, you can provide a visual. And if you uh, it is a REST-based service and got a model, models are not that uh, uh, used in practice. But if you have a model, you can do that. And if you have any uh, kind of tags to identify the API, then you can uh, put some tags as well. Okay. And then there's a tier because now you have a SLA with your consumer. So you need to um, uh, provide a SLA and then have a kind of a different type of levels like bronze, gold, silver, and unlimited. These are the default levels, but you can change it. Based on that, you can invoke the API, number of API calls that you can do. Uh, in a given time period, because otherwise it will be really hard for you to uh, provide the SLA. So for this, uh, I will use unlimited. And some additional metadata, like which business unit owns this, and then technical owner or the developer, like that, you can define. And then the interesting part, how you kind of architect your uh, REST API. So you can architect your REST API by using this. So we can add a resource. So I will use, um, uh, to make it simple, I will use uh, resource like order and then uh, for the demo purpose I will use get as the um, HTTP verb and you have secure it based on the application or application user because different people use the authentication in different levels and then I will create the uh, API since API got a life cycle once you create API it will go to a um, state called created and um, so this is a new API, and it's in the created state. So uh, I need to publish it for invocation. So what I'll do, I will go to this API, and there's a life cycle, and I will publish the API. So uh, it got uh, uploaded. Uh, now uh, the, uh, the publisher part is over. So what I'll do, uh, I'll go to the uh, store or the marketplace, and then uh, subscribe and try to invoke the API. So this is the marketplace that uh, provide all the APIs uh, that you have published. So this is the new API uh, that uh, provide a URL like this. And I didn't put any kind of additional metadata. So if you put like the documentation and then the forums, uh, those things will be appear based on uh, how you define your API. So uh, I need to sign up first. 
so it provides a self uh, registration. So I will use uh, Apache 2013, sorry, 13 as a username and some password. And there are more details, but these are the mandatory stuff, and you can create the user. So uh, now we can log into the uh, uh, store. Okay. Now, uh, so what uh, usually a developer will do, now you have multiple applications, so you need to register your application. So we will assume we are going to develop something, a uh, mobile app for Apache, and uh, you can add that particular app. Then you can go to the subscriptions. Now I don't have any subscriptions, so what I'll do, I'll go to this API and um, select my application, which application I need to subscribe, and do the subscription. So that way uh, you will come to the keys. So if we have two uh, APIs, sorry, uh, sandbox and uh, production, you can generate keys separately for the uh, uh, the sandbox and the production. But it will use the same uh, URL, depend on the key it defined uh, where to route the traffic. So these are the keys that generated a consumer key, consumer secret, and a uh, access token. So uh, what I'll do, I'll uh, try to invoke the API. Um, this is the uh, URL, and so uh, this is a usual invocation uh, with the uh, auth headers. Uh, So what I'll do, I'll change this part. with my URL. Okay, so it should fail because I am using a different uh, access key, so it gave me an error. So now what I'll do, I'll get the actual key provided by the, uh, generated by the store and invoke the API. I'll change the, uh, this is access token. So I'll change the access token and take it from my subscriptions. So technically it should work, we'll see. Is it still defined as a bearer type? Sorry? Is it still defined as a bearer type? Yeah, let me check. Okay, uh, so I got the value, the same value I had uh, earlier. So I'll use the href and then invoke it again. Should give me the JSON output. Okay, so that's how you can like uh, subscribe and then uh, use the key and invoke the API. So I'll go back to the publish and show you the statistics. 
So basically, it provides you. Uh, so this is coming from the uh, the uh, the uh, Hadoop jobs that uh, listen to Cassandra and then uh, update the relational database, and then this pick value from this uh, from that database. So basically, it provides like um, the usage of the API, who invoke what type of information, and the subscription information, who has subscribed, and uh, the, uh, the basically the latency of a particular API. So you can kind of fine tune your backend APIs by looking at this information. And um, the last access time, and uh, based on the resource path, who invoke uh, which resource, that type of information, and fault invocations as well. So uh, uh, those are the basic statistics, but you can introduce your own statistics as well. And then you can manage the APIs, like you can revoke the APIs as well as um, you can see uh, about subscriptions, who has subscribed for what. So basic uh, information to manage your APIs are provided. So all these components are running in this machine, like the Cassandra ring, uh, the Hadoop jobs. That's why it takes little time to uh, do the rendering. And um, um, uh, But if you have a proper distributed system, it uh, works basically in our test labs. We manage to run in an 8 gig uh, a dual core uh, type of a low end server, we can handle around uh, 8,000 transactions per second uh, with uh, kind of a three millisecond uh, latency. But in production, uh, with uh, like kind of proper um, hardware, you can do around 20, 30,000 TPS in a single node and uh, do the scaling as well. Uh, so that's all uh, I have uh, line up. Basically, what I want to highlight, like how we leverage the API, compare the Apache um, product, and then uh, build this uh, enterprise level API management solution uh, that used by many organizations today. Any questions? <laughs> So the API calls that you actually monitor, is it like a really completely scalable solution or if you have like thousands or of API requests, will you be able to monitor it at that level or do you do sampling or how? Yeah, so the basically the by default, it's near real time because it write to Cassandra and then we run the, uh, the map reduce jobs based on the schedule time. Okay, so that's um, that way. Like you can scale based on the uh, number of API calls that uh, hit uh, basically get the uh, max TPS, and then you can scale that layer. So, uh, but if you need real time, then we have a model called uh, CEP backed uh, analyzing. So what we do now, you write to the Cassandra ring, and parallelly you write uh, update the data into a CEP engine. So we have a CEP engine called Siddhi. I, again, open source uh, uh, CP engine. So we inject the events to the uh, the CP engine and then get the real time data out of that because uh, that uh, uh, can handle around uh, I can't exactly 200k TPS kind of a high performance CP engine. So you can uh, have that type of a volume to a single node. And again, that CP engine you can vertically and horizontally scale as well. You can partition the buckets based on uh, the streams that you have. Uh, so it's kind of scalable, and especially like um, we use it for kind of healthcare that got a lot of transactions, and even telcos as well. So can scale. And the, the Cassandra basically is the default uh, because um, so people ask why we didn't use uh, HDFS, but uh, we started with Cassandra, but you can plug like HDFS or uh, Mongo or any uh, NoSQL database. Yeah. Um, I may have missed this earlier, but uh, for your gateway, what do you actually use for caching? So uh, uh, we have two uh, uh, implementations. First one is InfiniSpan, and then we moved to Hesselcast recently 
but both are compatible both can be used and uh, we have one user who uh, kind of reconfigure it with uh, terracotta because they have a lot of uh, they need to store a lot of uh, uh, the uh, the uh, access tokens and keys so they use uh, terracotta as well so uh, in, in in a very high level uh, anything jsr 107 uh, i think the cache in implementation so any any cache in implementation compi compatible with jsr 107 can be uh, used as the cache in implementation I think that's it. Okay, thank you.